Testing one, two, three. Can you hear me? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Okay. All right. So here's your your audience today, and uh, and basically we're discussing the 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 long term stock stock exchange. And we had a few questions. Uh, and one of the question I had was, uh, so you've been doing this for for a while now, huh? Well, more than ten years, yeah. And so uh, the uh, have you seen results already uh, in terms of the the company that you have boarded, and what type of results have you seen? Yeah, well, it's still very early days, even though it's taken 10 years, because uh, just the first eight years or so was taken up um, getting the regulatory approval to do the exchange and to get the exchange open was, you know, was a Herculean effort and took <laughs> took really a, a, a ridiculously long time. And then after that, we had, um, you know, a long road to get the first companies to list with us. So still, that's only still just happened. Uh, a few years ago, so we're still still very, very early on. But I'm very pleased with the results so far. Um, you know, since people said this was impossible, uh, getting it started is already a huge victory against the idea that it couldn't be done. And then the the companies that are listed with us are seeing really remarkable results as a you know as a consequence. So uh, we're going to have more to share about that. I and mean, we're a highly regulated business, so I can't say that much. But we'll have more to share on the details um, soon. And you can see the the effect that listing with us has had on the quality of their shareholder base, how long term their investors are, uh, the effect it's had on their employees, like all kinds of good stuff that we're we're excited about. So I think that's a promising start. It's not we're not done by any means, but it's a promising start to show that reform of our capital markets, of our way of doing capitalism, is possible. Thank you. And so um, the the way the way we understand it, and and we're discussing the the models that we have here in uh, in uh, in Europe that are similar. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. you want to talk about uh, the uh, share the the models and, and compare that to the. To the... Yeah, we talked. Hi, nice meeting you. So we talked a little bit about the steward ownership model, which is practiced very much in in the Nordics with companies like Novo Nordisk, Carlsberg, Lego. Maersk, etc., et where they, you know, that company that was one time owned by a number of people or a family suddenly releases all the value into a fund, and that fund is owned by itself, you could say. And then it has a commercial mm -hmm. arm, and it might have a, a non profit arm, you could say, for research or charity mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. it do. And uh, of course, those ways of uh, thinking about value for more. Than only the shareholders, of course, uh, also moves how how culture in business is uh, defined and and goes from generation to generation. Yes, what's your question? I agree, hundred percent. No, sorry, 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 sorry. sorry. I, I think more uh, Frank had a question. Could you combine being? Oh yes, a... oh yes, absolutely. I, I'm an advocate for that. For those that don't know. It, by conventional theories of corporate finance and, uh, co and corporate strategy, that model ought to be inferior to our ruthlessly efficient public companies that are owned by their public shareholders exclusively. And yet, it's like an open secret. If you look at the research, those companies outperform. But that's impossible. How could they outperform without the ruthless efficiency that capitalism requires to race to the bottom and exploit as much as possible? People have internalized an ideology that is false about what capitalism is. We have been taught that ruthlessly exploiting our partners is a source of competitive advantage, when in fact it is the reverse. Every time a big company does something exploitative, uh, a startup somewhere high fives and cheers, because every act of exploitation is, an, is in a vulnerability you have, is a self-inflicted wound. You've created an opportunity for someone else to come steal your customers because you've mistreated them, to poach your employees because they don't like working there, to uh, undercut you on price or performance because you're squeezing for your own margin's sake. Anyway, selfish behavior is not profitable in the long run. So yeah, I'm a big believer that we should adopt that model um, in for-profit companies in general, I think um, there's there's the there's the foundation controlled version, but there's there's actually several several ways that that can be structured that are different for different industries. There's what's called a perpetual purpose trust or a mission trust, uh, is a very powerful way of doing it. Um, but but anyway, I, I, there's not there's the versions where it's a nonprofit foundation. There's versions where it's more like a traditional holding company. Even what Warren Buffett has done with Berkshire Hathaway has more in common with those foundation-owned companies than your typical for-profit public company has. 
Um, so I actually, my personal belief is that the category, we've made a category error as a civilization. We divide the world into for-profit and non-profit uh, incorrectly because these companies that are owned by a non-profit foundation are far more profitable than the so-called for-profit companies that sell cigarettes or other merchants of death who are nothing but, you know, just are, are destined for self-collapse. It's like a Ponzi scheme. So to me, the definition of profit should be re-understood to be um, the maximization of human flourishing. That's what makes you a for-profit company. You take inputs and you create more flourishing with those inputs than, than could have been done without you. You're a necessary part of the advancement of the human civilization. And if you are not doing that, that's what is a not-for-profit. But you know, once you cut the world that way, a lot of the conundrums of corporate governance and these questions about structure go from being impossible and unsolvable to quite simple. Mm -hmm. How much of the problem you think is um, attributable to buybacks, shareholder value theory? Right before you came on, we were saying that shareholder value theory advanced in Friedman's article in 1970 to GM, left GM bankrupt. So there go the shareholders, right? But 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 it seems like that's the root of all evil. But it also seems like it hasn't hasn't been real good. I mean, people are like, we want back the economy of the 50s and 60s. The shareholder value theory came along in the 70s and 80s and kind of yeah. ate the world. Well, and we shouldn't we shouldn't valorize the economy of the fifties and sixties. It's not like it was the most inclusive and uh, forward looking, you know. In, in other words, so, so I think looking to the past is is helpful for inspiration, but we can't go backwards. And yeah, look, the shareholder value theory is ridiculous. I mean, just to be super clear, it makes no sense. Uh, and it's 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 falsifiable, like at an abstract level, but also the empirical <laughs> the data's in. We've been running this experiment for fifty years, and it's been a disaster. It's been terrible. It's been terrible. and the, the, obviously, from a moral perspective, it's been unconscionable. But leave but morality and ethics aside, on its own terms about maximizing shareholder value, it's not very good. It's not very effective. It, it, exactly what you say we 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 hollow these companies out and leave them bankrupt. How has that advanced the cause of shareholders? It doesn't actually make sense. And I could give you a million examples, but you know the examples. You don't need me to tell you. The emperor has no clothes here and everybody knows it. I'll just tell you one, one funny example, kind of sad example, actually. You, I don't know if you remember the, the, uh, the airline Virgin America. Richard Branson had an airline he, he owned in the US. And um, it was it was great. It was American airlines are horrible. And so it was like to have a, a slightly non-horrible American airline. We were really excited. And I used to fly it all the time. And I was flying it in particular between San Francisco and DC when I was working on the regulation of LTSC getting it approved. And then be, due to a, a quirk of American law, I won't get into the reasons why. Anyway, Branson didn't have founder control over Virgin America. It was owned by the shareholders, controlled by the shareholders. And they uh, the board decided over his objections to sell it to an American airline. And now everything that made it special is gone. Tale as old as time. But I happened to be in DC the day that the merger was announced. So I was flying Virgin America and I checked in to the airport and Heathrow and um, everyone was morose. There were all these baggage handlers and uh, flight attendants and the, the ticket, they're all, they're all mingling about talking. And I, I'm as my naive American self coming, hey, howdy, how you doing? And I like checking for my flight and they're looking at me like, uh-huh. And I said, look, how do you all feel about this merger and the person taking my bags just gave me a lecture about the nature of our capital markets, the greediness of investors, the inability to see the long term, the the, uh, the prioritization of short term profit, the abandonment of corporate purpose. I mean, he could have been. I was like, you, you're a genius. And he's like, no, I'm not. A, every person there was nodding along like this was the most obvious thing in the world, what he was saying. And I had spent, it was, it hit me like a ton of bricks because I had spent the whole day with very elite, highly educated, powerful people, regulators, politicians, lawyers, bankers. I've been in DC the whole day talking to them about our capital markets. And they were all like, is it really a problem? Oh, maybe it's fine. You know, once interest rates go up, it will, the problem will go away. It'll solve itself. We, every, and I was like, these people have utterly lost the plot and the baggage handler understands the situation better than they do. What is What does that say about our, about our society? What have we done? This makes very little sense. So because 
But but I, I do want to say that this problem is older than the shareholder theory, the shareholder primacy theory. It's important to understand, like some, I might date it back to the advent of slavery, if you want to be real historical about it. Um, the idea that humans are a resource to be exploited um, and that it could be seen as profitable to have a business that makes money at the destruction of human potential. Um, that's an older and more insidious idea than you can blame Milton Friedman for. And if you think about like, think about the genocide in the Americas and the colonization of, of the new world, so-called, um, it's really fascinating to me that, that European settlers committed a genocide for the privilege of harvesting, of growing and harvesting tobacco of all things to poison themselves with. So like who benefited from this situation? You know, is actually like very complicated and um, deeply human tragedy that we are still implicated in to this day. And if you want to be depressed, I recommend there's a book called The Enlightened Capitalists. Big, big, fat book written by a business school professor. It's very well written. And it's a case study method book describing people who have discovered, independently rediscovered over the course of the past 150 years, that because the ideology of capitalism is about competition and efficiency, that if you discover a better way of making more money for your investors, you should be a hero. Your ideas will spread. Companies will copy you because, of course, industrialists will be thrilled. Anything that makes more money must be good. And then discovering the hard way that that's not the ideology of capitalism. The whole thing is a fiction. So what happens in story, you just read the book, story after story after story, someone invents a better way. They trail every, they make, uh, uh, the first story in the book, I think is from a textile mine in Britain from the 1860s, I think. Uh, anyway, uh, not textile mine, a textile factory. And he figures out by treating the workers better, by investing in their education and housing, by doing all this good stuff that, that takes the thing from bankruptcy to record profits. The investors are horrified intervene, get them kicked out of the company, get it run, turn right back to conventional management methods and drive it right back into bankruptcy. What's going on? Why is that, why is that happening over and over and over again for 150 years? Like something's wrong. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark, as they say. Can, can, I, can I ask you one thing? I mean, now, now you've been future thinking 10 years ago about this new kind of stock exchange. You've also been future thinking coming out of the startup innovation era. So, so how do you not only try to turn large companies into that stock exchange, but how can we foster this founder team when they are three person in a garage in that vision founder team fit somehow and get this DNA into it? Yes. Them? Oh, my favorite so, question. Thank okay, you so for asking what, me. What is your take on that? This is my work. That's I do that every day. I talk to founders literally every day. And people used to call me to, to ask me about MVPs, you know, lean startup stuff, metrics. And so I still get those calls pretty regularly. But more and more and more people want to talk to me about governance, about structure, about purpose. It's becoming much more popular of a topic to talk about. And for many founders, including founders that already have an incorporated company, I'm the first person to talk to them about their own governance, even though they already have an incorporated company. And I always ask them this question. I'm really anti-tobacco, have you noticed? Sorry if anyone here is pro-tobacco. So. Sorry. Yeah, but... uh, not not going to change my mind, so we'll just we'll agree to disagree. Um, if Philip Morris or some, some evil company offered to buy your company for you for $1 more per share than it's currently worth, would you sell it to them? And most founders either just say no, or they say, well, I guess it depends. Depends on what? Well, what are they going to use it for? They're going to use it to sell cigarettes to children. They'll be like, absolutely not. Over my dead body would I do such a thing. And I said, that's very interesting. You should say so. Let me pull your corporate charter that you you yourself filed. It has your wet signature right here on the page. You filed this charter in the state of Delaware in, in the US. Let me read what it says. It says here that according to most governance experts, you have a fiduciary duty to say yes if Philip Morris does this thing. And they're like, that can't be right. I'm like, read it. It's in black and white. Read it. And they're like, my lawyer would never have let me do It's like, your lawyer gave you the standard package, and this is the standard package. And so that's the beginning for, I've done this now with probably 100 companies where we then go have the conversation to figure out what do we do. Some, some founders don't have the courage to do anything about it. They just live in existential terror. But more and more and more founders are willing to change the incorporation, change the structure, be a little more forward thinking about it. And it's funny that we're having this conversation because I was going to say it reminds me of what the lean startup movement was like right at the time of the financial crisis. 
And I'll tell you a funny story. I happened to be in Paris right in like 2009 or 10, right when Lean Startup was starting to bubble up and I was invited to give a talk. I can't remember where now, uh, uh, an accelerator or something in, in Paris. And I and I was I was on a European tour, so I'd gone to several countries in a row. Um, you know, the food was a very variable quality depending on what country I was in. But I ate very well when I was in Paris, as you would no doubt imagine, and everything was very beautiful. And I was having a wonderful time, as Americans always do in Paris. And I asked, I got into a taxi. I said I gave the person the address of where I wanted to go for my talk, and um, they dropped me off on one of those huge. I don't know what they're called. Those huge Parisian super blocks where it's like many blocks merge together and there's only pedestrian pathways between them. And there's no like numbers or anything. For an American, this is like extremely confusing. And I'm wa I'm literally, just, my wife and I are wandering around the streets of Paris, no idea how to find this venue where I'm supposed to be giving a talk, you know, in half an hour. <laughs> and, and all of a sudden I start to see people walking towards all in a certain direction and they all have a certain look. They were like, you know, there was like a, the guy in the ponytail wearing black, it was a guy with a, you know, I don't remember what, some dorky t-shirt, you know, with a joke about math on it. And my wife, I didn't, I was like, that's odd. These people are here. And my wife, and everyone else, it's, it was, it was, you know, it was Paris in the summer. Everyone else was beautifully dressed and, you know, everyone was very refined and had a, a sense of fat. And then there's these people that look very different. And my wife had the end. She said, listen, just follow them. They'll, they'll lead you to the, to the event. I said, how do you know? She's like, trust me, I know. And she was completely right. We just followed the dorky guys to the event and there it was. And it was like, I was in Paris. I was so far from home. And yet my community, I felt, I never felt more comfortable. My entire time in France, I never felt more comfortable than in that evening with people who were all in my tribe. They didn't speak English, but we were one tribe, one community, one movement. We all wanted the same thing. That's what, what Lean Startup was like in the early days. It was just this international um energy around changing the way that startups were built that I got to be part of. And it was amazing. And I feel that same bubbling energy for this that I felt for that. So I think the next couple of years are going to be real interesting. I have a, I have a follow-up question uh, about, yes. about the, you know, early stage startups that want to make a positive impact and, you know, helping them in their go-to market, their funding and so on. Like, do you have any, I don't know, interesting insight or, you know, something to share to, but what can be done, you know, like a decentralized way? I don't know exactly, but you see, my, you see what mm -hmm. I'm asking about? Yeah, 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 sure, sure. So um, I, this is a hard question to answer in brief. So I'll just give you the sketch of an answer and then you'll have to deep dive, dive deeper if you want to know more. I'm obviously happy to talk offline. So there are operational things that can be done and there are governance things that can be done. And one of the problems is today we see governance and operation as two different things. And most founders are told to focus on operations for now and leave governance to the future. And because they're not two different things, that doesn't work. My saying, the thing I've learned is that it's always too early until it's too late. If founders don't, if you don't do it when it's too early, you'll wind up having, you'll regret having not done it when it's too late. So we have to do both. We have to say, and, and the, the tool I use to imagine what to do is just to ask ourselves, what does it mean in my business, my, my uh, category, my industry? What does it mean to be a trustworthy counterparty? That's, that's really the only thing you have to ask. Why should anybody trust me with their private data? Trust me you know, that my product won't kill them. I was, I was working with a company the other day that makes uh, flying round circular, they can roll on the ground and they can fly autonomous robots. And I was like, look, I, I want to have this meeting with you. I appreciate it. But like, is it just me or do these look like killer robots from science fiction? And he's like, yeah, we get that a lot. You know, they, yes, <laughs> these robots can go anywhere. They can fly, they can roll, they can collapse down and go into stuff. It's like so dangerous, these things, that they were to get out of control. So I was like, look, you're asking people to trust you with the technology of killer robots. What's the plan? Why should anyone trust you? And every founder answers the same way. They're always like, well, I'm such a good guy. You should trust me because I have such good intentions. And it's like, I'm sorry, that's not going to cut it for the killer robots. Like your good intentions don't mean anything to me. What kind of promises are you going to make? And that's really what we have to figure out is how do we make promises? Now, that here's the issue. Making a promise is easy for a person. And even still, we mess it up. For an organization, it's very difficult because companies, organizations are literally super organisms. My belief is they are literally alive, as alive as you or me. 
We are their cells and organs that make them up, but we do not control them and we do not own them. There is no corporate slavery either. And so once you understand that a, 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 an organization is a super organism, you see how no individual person can ever make a promise on behalf of the super organism because the individual can be replaced. You could die, you could be fired, but the organization will live on and might live on forever. So we have to find ways to embed our promises into the structure of the organization, into its DNA, such that we can gain the competitive advantage of being trustworthy. And so that leads to things like in, in America, I don't know what the, the European equivalents are, but in the US, we have something called the Public Benefit Corporation, which is a, a different legal designation companies can have to say that I have some mission or purpose beyond just making a profit. I'm actually the person who asked about the stewardship trust model. I'm a big believer in that. I call it the spiritual holding company, the entity at the center of the most most companies are not one legal entity. They're usually multiple. There's a foundation. There's a union. There's a you know a care delivery vehicle. There's a pension. There's uh, there's we we proliferate entities when we build companies. But who's at the center holding on to the vision, mission, purpose of the company? I call it the spiritual holding company. Um, when we structure that way from the beginning, it's much easier than having to do it later. <laughs> Obviously, we can do founder control provisions, voting rights, board control rights are very important. And we have to understand, people always say, well, investors might not like it, which is true. Some investors might not like it. But first of all, some investors like it more. So that's good. But also, so what if they don't like it? This is, uh, uh, capitalism is about competition. If it's a source of superior competitive advantage, then the best investors should want to invest in us regardless. And so by really putting that to investors from the beginning, startups are able to determine, it's like a selection test, which investors are really serious about supporting the company and which ones are not. Uh, it's very important. Didn't we just see this with the meltdown of OpenAI and, and not long before at, over at Twitter with the, the takeover and the Perlman issue? I mean, the case- Oh my God, it's like- uh, um, Perfect illustration. I won't get into the open AI thing because that's somewhat complicated and there, and I'm I know all the people involved, so I shouldn't say too much there. But I but I'll but, but Twitter's a good example because it was all done in public. And I'll never forget there was a journalist who got access to the board deliberations as they were thinking about selling Twitter. And it was really fascinating because the entire debate was about what is best for the shareholders and what will maximize their share price. And all the reporting was about that too. The whole discussion, but we were having as a society, to me, it was like as a society, we were having a nervous breakdown. All we could talk about was should they sell or not sell? Is this a good price or not a good price? And there was not one minute of conversation in the board at all about what would be best for Twitter's mission. Like turning Twitter into like a, a haven for neo-Nazis. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Nobody cares. Let's just make some money. And if you've studied the 1930s, it should have the hairs on the back of your neck uh, going up. That's all I'll say about that. Another question? No, I, I don't have more questions, but I, I, I like your take here on the vision mission parts. I just wanted to, maybe you know about this project, but it's very interesting. I just browsed it through here. Uh, and I had a meeting with them. There's something called purpose-economy.org mm -hmm. out of the uh, Netherlands. Yes. You know Askim Hansen, mm -hmm. the founder? Okay, very good. Because you should know about that because you know, they sell- I know, I know, actually, I know they're American. I know the person that brought that to the US version, okay. but I don't know the European, I don't know their European counterparts. Actually. Okay, but it's interesting that you, they sell one share of the company which contains the purpose mission. So if the founders are diluted, uh, yeah, the, the golden share. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If you so want, if you want to see a contemporary example, I helped set up something called the Anthropic Long Term Benefit Trust, the LTBT, for the AI company Anthropic, which I think they've they're one of the few companies that's been public about their trust structure, and it's a very good like that. That's a particularly good structure. I do if I do say so myself, having helped design it. Um, but I think that's something that companies are going to copy more and more often. And that was done with a golden share. They got class T share, it was called. Thanks for sharing. My pleasure. Thank you all very much. I hope this was helpful. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody.